Newborn Orca brings holiday cheer and fear to Seattle whale watchers. This headline accurately captures the complex emotions marine biologists are feeling right now. Hope and cheer for a few reasons. Obviously, everyone loves baby animals, especially when they are southern resident killer whales. This endangered population has been steadily declining since the mid-90s, and recent studies have found that there is a very real risk they'll go extinct within our lifetime. There are only 72 southern resident orcas left, and every new calf provides a glimmer of hope that they can reverse course. But the sad truth is that the survival rate of newborn killer whales is very low. An estimated 50% of all orca calves die in the first six months. So each one of these calves faces an uphill battle and daunting odds. Quick content warning, the story and the images are heartbreaking. The fear from the very beginning was that this little whale named J61 wasn't going to make it. Especially since J61 initially appeared to be struggling and not very lively. Perhaps even premature. Her mom, J35, also known as Taliqua, was observed pushing J61 around with her head trying to keep her at the surface and breathe. These fears grew when no one saw Taliqua or J61 for several days. Then, on New Year's Eve, there was hope. Orca J61 still alive after days missing. There was even more good news. The calf was visibly healthier and more robust than it had been just a few days before. But that's because it wasn't J61. A closer look at photographs showed that this calf wasn't with Taliqua or the rest of the family. This mysterious new calf was with a different group of orcas. Sadly, everyone's fear was confirmed on New Year's Day when Taliqua was observed carrying the remains of J61. If this sounds familiar, it's because it has happened before. In 2018, Taliqua made headlines around the world when she carried her dead calf for 17 days and 1,000 miles. Many called this her 1,000 mile tour of grief. There is still hope because of this little mysterious one, J62. But who is J62 and who is their mom? Let's dive into orca moms, calves, grief, hope, and the challenges facing the southern resident killer whales. I'm KP, a marine biologist who specializes in marine mammals. There are an estimated 50,000 orcas spread across every ocean in the world, but they're not all the same. While the 50,000 orcas are currently classified as the same species, Orchinus orca, scientists currently recognize at least 10 distinct variations known as ecotypes. And each ecotype has a unique physiology, appearance, hunting behavior, and distinct genetic markers. Because of these differences, current research argues that many of these ecotypes should be classified as distinct species entirely, specifically the bigs and the resident orcas. DNA studies and genetic evidence suggest that the resident and bigs ecotypes diverged roughly 300,000 years ago about the same time as Neanderthals and humans diverged. Today, we're focusing on the southern resident killer whales. They are a unique subpopulation native to the sheltered coastal waters of the Salish Sea. Salish Sea, say that 10 times fast. Specifically, the Puget Sound in Washington State and the Strait of Georgia in British Columbia, Canada. These orcas travel in extremely stable social groups and the sheltered coastal waters of the Salish Sea make encountering these whales easy and predictable. This has allowed scientists to study the southern residents more thoroughly than any other cetacean in the world. There are no unidentified killer whales in these waters, and every single individual's place in their society is known to the scientific community. Tails down for measuring, but look at this, like, we'll figure out who it is. It's the kind of aerial image we're after where we can see us, the notch in his tail, and we can see his snout, so we can measure his length. And importantly, we can link these measures to, to known individuals. If we zoom in at his saddle, you can see L87. You can see his left saddle, it has this black incursion into it. And his right saddle is pretty, what we call a closed saddle. It's mostly white. These orcas live in close-knit family groups known as matrilines. A typical matriline consists of the eldest matriarch, her offspring, and the offspring of her daughters. This is because killer whales stay with their mothers for life. A group of matrilines form a southern resident pod, which is stable in membership. The southern resident population is composed of three pods that have been named J, K, and L pods. And all three pods are friendly, cooperative, and social with each other. They often meet up in what's known as a southern resident superpod. 
because it's super. <laughs> This video from 2013 shows one such Southern resident super pod. It was filmed in Active Pass and comprised all three J, K, and L pods. One really important thing to know about the Southern residents is that they are a closed population with no emigration or dispersal of individuals and no gene flow with any other orca populations. This means orcas from the bigs or northern resident populations aren't going to join these pods. Their numbers can only grow from within through calves like J61 and J62 who were born into the J pod. J pod is probably the most recognized of the southern residents because they spend more time in the inner Salish Sea near Vancouver and Seattle than any other pod. Famous among these matriarchs was J2, Granny, who urban legend claimed lived to be 106 years old. Like most urban legends, this isn't true. Biopsy samples taken from her prove that she lived into her late 60s or early 70s. The 106 year estimate was based on a mistake. For a long time, it was believed she had to be 100 years old because she was the mom of a 60 year old male named Ruffles or J1. This is because they spent so much time together. But genetic testing showed that Granny was not Ruffles' mom. Ruffles was from L-Pod. Ruffles was also a prolific sire and fathered 18 calves from all three of the Southern resident pods, including Taliqua's sister, J28, Polaris. Taliqua and Polaris were born to J17, Princess Angeline, and both had calves in 2010. Polaris had a daughter named Star and Taliqua had a boy named Notch. Notch was named after his distinctive notch in the dorsal fin. Star and Notch grew up together, along with Taliqua's younger brother, Moby, and the three appear to be very close. In 2016, Polaris tragically died, likely from complications of giving birth to her second calf, J54. Star and Taliqua tried to care for the newborn calf. On multiple occasions, Taliqua and Star were observed trying to feed salmon to J54, and they both were bringing him up to the surface so he wouldn't drown. Unfortunately, they of course can't eat salmon at this stage. So despite these efforts, J54 passed away later that month. Star has remained with her aunt, Taliqua, ever since. In 2018, Taliqua gave birth to her second calf, one that died after just a few hours. As we know, Taliqua carried the body around for 17 days. This is called epimiletic behavior, which is when animals stand by others in danger or they give care to injured, ill, or even dead individuals. It has been observed in several cetacean species, most frequently in bottlenose dolphins. The reason for this post-mortem attentive behavior isn't fully understood. Some possible explanations that have been put forward are that these might be attempts to revive and protect the animal, or it might be a failure to recognize or accept that an offspring or companion has died. And it could also be that a strong attachment resulted in a difficulty of letting go, possibly related to grieving. This is just my personal opinion, but I do think it's a, it's a bit of a combination of all of these things. Taliqua is caring for a dead calf, trying to protect it, and might not recognize that it is dead, which to me looks a lot like the denial or bargaining stage of grief. The Center for Whale Research said we cannot know what is in Taliqua's mind or assume her thoughts and emotions, but what is plain to see is that she is not ready to let the calf go. The concern now is for Taliqua's health. Orca calves weigh around 300 pounds. Every time she lets go or a wave knocks it away from her, she dives and retrieves it, and that takes a tremendous amount of energy. Energy she can't replenish because she can't rest or forage while carrying the baby. Last time this happened, Taliqua started showing signs of weakness around day six and she began falling behind her pod. That's when Star and other orcas began taking turns carrying the body while Taliqua rested. After 17 days and 1,000 miles, Taliqua let go of the calf and rejoined her pod. In addition to Notch and Star, Taliqua has helped raise her younger brother and sister, Moby and Kiki, who were born in 2009 and 2015. Kiki's mother, Princess Angeline, died in 2018 when Kiki was three, and Taliqua has acted as her adopted mother ever since. And in 2020, two years after her famous tour of grief, Taliqua gave birth to a healthy boy, J57, who is named Phoenix after the immortal bird that rises from the ashes. Notch, Star, 
Moby, Kiki, and Phoenix now make up the J17 matri line and are always seen by Taliqua's side. Taliqua is a very special orca and her story is a reflection of both the strength and the plight of the Southern Resident Killer Whales. I gave myself goosebumps. It's a really sad it's story. It's so sad. Now there are reasons for hope. One reason is J62. As I touched on, J62 appears to be very healthy, robust, and vibrant, which surprised observers when they originally mistook it for J61. But after looking at the photographs, the orcas caring for J62 were clearly from the J16 and J19 matrilines. Both J16s and J19s descend from J4, Mama. So the members of these two different matrilines are all cousins and they have very close relationships. Here is J62 with the J19s. Right now, it is currently believed that one of the J19s is the calf's mom, either the matriarch Sachi or her daughter, J41, Eclipse. We should know for sure any day now, but my guess is that Eclipse is likely the mother. Sachi is 45, and that is very old for an orca to be having calves. Studies have found evidence that killer whale females go through menopause, and most stop reproducing in their 30s or 40s. That leaves Eclipse, who is a fascinating orca. Her father was also J1, Ruffles. Ruffles is a great name for not only a killer whale, but any animal. It's because he had a wavy uh, dorsal fin. No, it's because of the shapes. Eclipse was born in 2005, and many feared she wasn't going to survive because she was very tiny and maybe even premature. But Eclipse didn't just survive, she thrived. In 2015, Eclipse was spotted with her first calf, J51 Nova. Eclipse was only nine or 10 at the time that Nova was born, making her the youngest Southern resident on record to ever reproduce. Many credit Nova's survival to her grandma, Sachi, who was seen countless times helping Eclipse raise Nova and apparently teaching Eclipse how to be a mom. In 2020, Eclipse gave birth to her second calf, Crescent. Both Nova and Crescent are currently healthy and flourishing. Eclipse's past success as a mom and the support she receives from Sachi and her cousins in the J16 matter line have given observers hope that J62 can beat those odds. I suspect that in the next couple of days, we'll get confirmation that either Eclipse or Sachi is the mum, and I'll post updates in the descriptions and pinned comment, as well as updates on Taliqua, who I know has again captured the hearts of everyone who hears her story. The factors contributing to these low survival rates are very well documented. For starters, there's a lack of food, specifically Chinook salmon, which makes up 80% of their diet. Research clearly shows that the survival and reproductive success of the killer whales is correlated with Chinook salmon abundance. That's because the mothers need to be robust with ample fat storage to help with the demands of lactation. Unfortunately, Chinook salmon are also endangered, so the orcas have to rely on coho and chum salmon that simply don't have the caloric value that a nursing mother needs. This is exacerbated by shipping noise, which can interfere with hunting. But there is good news and reason for hope, starting with new regulations taking effect this January designed to protect the Southern resident orcas. Boaters in Washington state will be required to stay at least 1,000 yards away from the Southern residents, which is more than double the distance under previous state regulations. And efforts are already underway to increase the abundance of Chinook salmon, from habitat restoration to removal of dams and culverts, giving the salmon access to historic spawning grounds. This last October, salmon swam freely in the Klamath River for the first time in a century after the largest dam removal project in U.S. history was completed. Marine biologists at NOAA have also experimented with the remote injection of antibiotics, as well as feeding trials where they essentially just drop Chinook salmon in front of these pods of orcas. It's like DoorDash. There is also hope that this new calf and Taliqua's story will inspire everyone to take action and protect the Southern resident killer whales before it's too late. Because if the Southern residents go extinct, it will be the first extinction of a species in which every individual animal's name was known. <laughs>